Greetings and welcome to the Saroth the Mage Experiment. Tonight I have a wonderful returning guest, uh, Richard T. Cole. We decided tonight that we weren't even going to discuss uh, Mr. Crowley or Thalema and we were going to dive into Richard's own experiences and ideas. So, Richard, you've had some paranormal experiences and you came to the conclusion that all um, phenomena, be they ghosts, aliens, uh, all came from the same source. What led you to that uh, conclusion? Research. Mm -hmm. And all... just observing the world and how the world, specifically the natural part of it, you know, the, the, the man-made stuff's rubbish. You, you, you'll not learn much from that. Mm -hmm. But by observing how nature works, it kind of dovetailed. I got the idea that the supernatural was just another part of nature that we didn't get. For whatever reasons, we just could not quite grasp what it was. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, you, you walk into a, a forest and there's lots of different kinds of trees, but they're all based on the same template of tree and I, I just got around to wondering if all things we perceive as as i guess paranormal supernatural religious et experiences are actually different forms of the same things it's almost like we, we receive a signal and the signal is interpreted as per our, our, our expect, experiences, yeah. expectations. Absolutely. And the, the more I pursued this line of inquiry, the, the more I started to narrow in on, 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 not at that point what the paranormal was, but how it worked and why it worked. And I, I had a based on a on a on a very silly super um, supernatural event involving my, my my partner's well the ghost of my partner's um, recently deceased dog. That's right. Something dropped. It was like it was, it was like a moment, uh, and the, the, the say it's like a moment of clarity. And in that moment, when I realised I was I was looking at the wrong dog, <laughs> it, uh, the penny dropped, and I thought bang, you've just had a supernatural experience, i.e. I saw the ghost dog, but it happened in consequence of just two factors. And at that moment, I saw the potential for a physical device, for want of a better word, that it, it, by use of which it would be possible to replicate the two conditions I had identified. And basically, you press the button, you get a paranormal experience. That was the intent of designing the box. And during its construction, see, because at, at the start, I, I, I looked at the kind of environmental and internal factors that must all synchronize a, a, about literally about a split second. You've got to get all of these criteria to focus on a single point at a single moment. And, and for a while, the, the technicalities of what I was trying to do, I was just overwhelmed. Didn't, didn't think I was, I was making any pro progress. Mm -hmm. And then I was tinkering with just a, two components, an audio and a, a visual component of the Horus toy. When I accidentally did something, and again, it was the ghost dog moment, but this time, I didn't actually realize that the machine worked, that it worked spectacularly, and that the complexity I'd envisaged was nonsense. Because if the process wasn't simple, paranormal experiences wouldn't happen so often. Yeah. The mechanisms got to be fairly tolerant, as I discovered. So anyway, following Three days after that, that, uh, that experience, as I described to you, Man in Black turns up at my door, warning me not to 
publish the, the kind of material that I'm, I'm, I will shortly be publishing, oddly <laughs> enough. He says, looking over his shoulder. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in, in all seriousness, I mean, you know, I, I, prior to this, I mean, I'd, I'd watched the movie with, um, what's his name, Will Smith, Men in Black. Oh, yeah. And I thought, well, yeah, that's funny. And, you know, I'd, I'd seen a few documentaries about these mysterious figures. But I can testify from first-hand experience, they exist because one visited me and he scared the fuck out of me. Wow. Did he look and like a, a regular human? I've heard they kind of look like people posing as humans. He just, I was about to say, he looked like, if you take every kind of actor from the kind of 50s Hollywood B movies, yeah? Mm -hmm. and kind of blend them into one homogenous face. That is what he looked like. He, he just looked like everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing about him that I didn't consciously appreciate, I don't think, until after he'd left, the guy didn't smell. And, I mean, he, he didn't smell of anything at all. And, and it was this absence of a smell that was almost more unsettling than him having two heads <laughs> because it, it was just this this deeply disturbing like this guy does not smell um and for probably for the following week or so my life just warped into complete insanity that that's that is all a kind of all encompassing mm -hmm. it just distorted out but the damn thing is the but the thinking part of me that kind of looks around and analyzes things mm -hmm. did its absolute utmost to convince me that nothing was happening nothing to see here yeah. and it, it was only later on really, really straining back and, and, and stringing these things together that you think, fuck, it happened because I did that. I accidentally fired the Horus toy and it did exactly what is claimed. It provoked a paranormal experience, i.e. a man in black. I mean, it also provoked a load of other shit, but that's kind of the man in the black is uh, is yeah. just kind of is the kind of one that really stands out. Yeah. So the fact that your mind didn't want to recognize this paranormal thing would be the psychic sensor. I, I suspect it, it's some kind of of like you say, a psychic sensor that's there just to prevent your mind from going into complete meltdown. Yeah. I understand that. I think actually Peter Carroll uh, used the phrase in Lieber Null and Psychonaut, the, the psychic sensor. Right. I don't recall where I got the expression from, but but it's a very apt one that it's almost like trying to put two magnets together. The closer you, you, know, you push them, mm -hmm. the harder it is to, to get them any closer together. And that's the psychic sensor. It just I think, it, like I say, I think it prevents your brain from being overwhelmed by sensory information of which it has no experience and no means of dealing with. Yeah, it reminds me of um, psychedelic experiences when the psychic sensor seems to be completely lifted and what looks like, a, a, you know, just an everyday thing that you ignore, everything becomes fascinating and complex. And, um, you know, I've had experiences with entities and all kinds of stuff on mushrooms and uh, DMT. Uh, have you dabbled in psychedelics, Richard? Oh, yes, but <laughs> only in a recreational way, not in a kind of any attempt to... To, to, to kind of occultize my my recreational drug experience. No, purely for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that was, sorry, uh, that carry was on. A, that was a long time ago in a different country for any lawful authority, <laughs> yeah. authority yeah. that may be, of may be listening. It's, never it's all behind me now, legal. officer. <laughs> um, but uh, there are no doubts about it. I mean, in the in the local woods and fields around where I live, it's full of what they call Liberty Cat mushrooms. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's and up here too. They 
the experience. I mean, you know, you, you can't really ascribe any objective reality, reality to it, mm -hmm. but it definitely opens up an entirely different level of perception or certainly of, of filtering. Absolutely. Um, and I, I always like the, the I always like the commonality of experience. The, the experience on, on Liberty Cat mushrooms, it's a very earthy experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as is countless times it has been reproduced in illustrations, oddly enough, for the kind of maybe Victorian fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And you only had to look at the cartoons to say, yeah, that's 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 a mushroom cartoon. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, psychedelics can't beat them. Don't give me children. <laughs> so uh, to go back a little, what are the two um, necessary components for the paranormal experience? I don't want you to give away everything about your Horus toy because there's a book coming out about that. But, you know, tell us what you can or feel comfortable with. Of course. Right. OK. OK. If you say you wanted to go into town, simply enough mundane thing, you want to go into town. Mm -hmm. There are two elements stripped down to all its complexities. There are two elements. There is, first of all, your desire. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there is your means of getting to town. Simple as that. That's all you need. Two elements. You need something to do and the means by which to do it. And the same applies with a magical aspiration. All you require is the thing that you want and the means of delivering it to the people who can bring it back. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 simple as that. So the, and, no, go on. I was just going to say, so how on earth could a, a physical device um, enable paranormal experiences. Okay, you're asking me, how is it possible that flicking a light switch can somehow illuminate a light? Yeah, that's true. I've got no idea how that works either. It's Electric. kind of like, uh, uh, right, occasionally, you get storms, yes? Mm-hmm. Under certain conditions, you get thunder. Under certain conditions, you get lightning. Mm -hmm. Same with the Horus toy. If you emulate two simple criteria, get them synced up, and it's, it's fairly easy to do, then you will create a paranormal experience for yourself. And what, whatever that means, I can't say because individual perception, upbringing, memories, whatever, will shape the nature of what of, of the paranormal experience. Yeah, it's like Robert Anton Wilson used to talk about the reality tunnel and the thinker thinks what the no the prover proves what the thinker thinks and all that kind of stuff. It's and. And in the past, okay, in the past, it, you know, I mean, basically we're talking about, I guess, grimoires here, that, that, that kind of thing. I mean, I was, you know, I was, I was thinking about one this afternoon and it's, it's by a guy called A.E. White and it's called, a very famous book, old, years old, and it's called, I think it's called Black Magic Pacts. Oh, yeah. Or, right. or something, something along that. And that is, I mean, I've, I have a, like a cheap paperback copy and... You read through that, and it's like eBay for a cultist. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I want three bars. I'm, <laughs> oh, yeah, I want one of them. <laughs> and, you know, you get this cute little flipping scribble and a few words. And it's like, whoa, OK, so ooh, I'm going to have to move that table because that, that great treasure is going <laughs> to take some room up. And all of these rituals promise so much. And they deliver nothing, absolutely nothing for all their claims. Some it, would argue with that slightly, but I'm not going to go there tonight. Um, 
I don't doubt because it, 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 the process of evolution, which is in, which is controlling the whole show anyway, yeah, gives us a way in an an evolutionary approved way in, and that's a way of connecting directly with the force, whatever you want to call it, that, that that's responsible for everything. It, it's not. It's not like Obi Wan said. It's not just a force that shapes. It, it's everything. It is literally everything. And the way you connect with that, you have to go. You have to go back to the onset of Crowley's Eon of um, Osiris. Mm -hmm. When we discovered that, that the male function in reproduction, that was our new way to the gods. That was the one state approved way of connecting with the kind of people that were going to um, grant you spells. Yeah. I don't know historically quite how long, <clears throat> excuse me, it took us to kind of pick up on that utilization of sexual energies. I, that's something I've, I've, I've not really researched. Mm. But from that moment to about, to, well, till December the 20th, 2012, that was the way in. That is the way. Of course, there is another way, the kind of way that, that pretty much everybody else used is you just batter your way in. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you know, this you, By you, any you, means necessary. Yeah, you, you, your magic wand's actually an astral crowbar that you jemmy the door open with threats and God knows what. And it, it's that wasn't a particularly good method anyway. And Horus, the onset of Horus, as Crowley called it, it has opened up an entirely new channel. Yes, I actually wrote uh, a quote down from that. It's, it's, you say there's a, a new, uh, we're going to acquire a new sense, basically. Like Yes, um, yes. we've already got it. The, the mere fact I was able to write 666 virtually demonstrates that we have acquired the sense because someone like me has picked up on it and spotted it and thought, whoa, yeah, we've, we've, we've acquired an extra dimension. Crowley nearly got it right. If you just tweak it, it's like, whoa, now you have got something that works. So there's a line in the book of the law, abrogate all rituals, basically saying, the Siren Age is over. Um, we're moving on to this new thing. So yes. Do you mean that forget the robes, forget the wands, forget all the, the, the apparatus and the kind of traditional ritual magic stuff and use the Horus toy? Is, is that um, what you I think the Horus toy, if you have a marginal interest in the occult you maybe you want to use the horus toy as people maybe we would have used the ouija board yeah mm -hmm. you can use it like that if you are a practicing occultist of whatever brand mm -hmm. and you get where the horus toy takes you then i, I don't want to sound like but uh, I don't, don't understand it, but it, it's almost like once you've tried the Horus toy and experienced the, uh, the dimensional shift it gives you. Do you remember the magic eye pictures of the yeah. what, eight? Yeah, oh, man, right? they incredible, yeah. That is what the Horus toy does. There was a knack does. to it, though. You had to yeah. kind of, yeah. Yeah, and that's what the Horus toy does. It, it learns you to focus your eyes, probably at the infinity of the event horizon of humanity, and out comes this whole new, like, wow, I thought that were flat. It's, you know, it, it, it's not flat. It's got sides and things on it. Yeah. And so the Horus toy is almost like a, it's almost like an upgrade to whatever system you're using mm -hmm. because for the first time it it explains what is actually happening beneath the the the, the kind of robes and the words of power and the sacred incense none of these have any intrinsic power yeah i've always suspected that 
And in the past, people have mistaken the kind of ritual itself and the results it, uh, that may or may not be generated for the mindset generated. And as I've discovered, you can discard everything except a particular mindset. Mm -hmm. Then again, oh, sorry. No, no, I was just saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> It's so, you know, in, in an oddly paradoxical way, the, the robes and the, the, the rituals and the ceremonies don't have any intrinsic power Mm -hmm. save that which you invest in them and then they develop not an external potency but a potency born of your belief it's like putting something heavy on a rubber sheet gravity the more you weigh down the more distortion you get mm -hmm. i mean i i actually started this channel um kind of as a, an occult dabbler, but I really what, wanted to know what is magic? You know, you're told it's this, it's that, it's cloaked in metaphor and, and um, lots of strange superstitions, but what is it at the heart? You know, I mean, obviously people uh, do, you know, it, it wouldn't still be practiced if people didn't get something from it. But I'm very much of the chaos magic um, mindset that, um, you know, belief is a tool, all that kind of stuff. I don't think anything has intrinsic magical value. It's what you invest in it and your belief system and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's it. That is about the, is about the size of it. So what about this, um, the idea of the, the throwing the pebble into uh, uh, water, uh, I think you call it the well of consciousness. And you also relate that interestingly to the uh, Kabbalistic tree of life. Could you go into that a little bit, Richard? Yes, I, I kind of equated a magical operation with that of dropping a pebble into water. So what happens is, as your pebble, hits the water, the flat water surface. You get a water column, lovely little cup water column. Mm -hmm. And then at the top, you get a separate droplet. Mm -hmm. And that is the same diagram that a black hole creates, except obviously we can't see the, um, the water droplet because that's behind the singularity. Mm -hmm. So, um... Talk about the levels and how it relates to the tree of life. Okay. Um, let's just have a look at this. Right. As you progress down the uh, kind of well of consciousness, as, as, as I've called it, mm -hmm. um, the deeper down you penetrate, the weirder things get. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, certainly the weirder. But it, it's almost like going down the elevator of a department store. You know, on the top floor, you might get men's suits, the second one, ladies' clothes. And your paranormal experience is very much like that. And that's why certain rituals or certain practices tend to produce the same results because they're penetrating to the same level. And uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the people that, that created the Hebrew tree of life, they must have had some kind of awareness of this process, they must have done, because the, their tree of life describes it perfectly, the, the, the transition from nothing to solid matter. It, it's just it, absolutely perfect. Um, but obviously they didn't, quite get what they were trying to say yeah obviously obviously they didn't or they would have invented the horus toy <laughs> and they'd say look forget all this ridiculous theory just press that button and bang paranormal experience all over your face a kether moment as you call it um yeah that's uh, that that was the moment that i like i said i i, I twigged what 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 was causing paranormal incidents? And I thought, yeah, 
I, I can I can replicate them in some kind of box, and it works. The box works, no question about it, because it the, a man in black game. Oh, well, now, absolutely. Uh, the um, men in black don't come calling for nothing. No, um, I like I said, it was it was an utterly surreal moment, utterly surreal. Yeah. Um, but there you go. That's that. Ultimately, I could trace that back to a, a product of the Horus toy. So for me, it happened. And I, I'll even tell you why it happened, which will give you an insight into how the Horus toy functions. At the time, I was very, very concerned, perhaps even a little bit paranoid about releasing this technique into the public domain. Yeah. And I was, because I have spoken to it, to a, a, a few friends who have said, I, you know, are, are, you, are you serious about <laughs> release, releasing this? Do you know what, you know, this could do? So anyway, at the time, that was utmost on my mind. So when I accidentally triggered the device, the paranormal experience I got was a man in black warning me not to publish it. Yeah. It, it was that thought that had driven down right to the bottom of the well. And it, when the splashback came, I got trapped in a water drop only for a few minutes, maybe, where a, a man in black showing me an absolutely impossible advert. That's right. I knew there was some uh, other element to that story. Oh, it was an ad advert for the Horus toy itself. Yes, based on my grandmother's old um, toaster, which started me off down that route. Wow. Um, and he showed me an advert for a, a physical product. I think it was American, as, as memory serves. And... I thought there is only one person in this in on this planet that could that could have that could have, that, that could have <clears throat> visualized, drawn, recreated, whatever that advert. And I thought, and yet he's he's got it from a like fifties magazine cut in it, and <laughs> and and that small fact alone, the the confusion that set into my brain, someone holding me. Sorry, holding in front of me an object that I knew could not possibly exist. That that was a real brain fuck moment. Oh, I can imagine. Um, but there you go. So I, I can't believe it, but uh, Zoom is telling me we've only got seven minutes left. So I'm wondering if we should finish in seven minutes or we should stop now and restart what like and do like a one and two like we did last time what do you think and entirely up to yourself whatever whichever way you want to play it i'm absolutely fine with okay i think we'll we'll stop here that'll be the end of part one and then right. we'll have a wee bit more on the other side so i will stop recording now richard um, and i will send you another link sorry about this. right no it's no amateur. problem I shall, comp I shall close all this down and watch out for your link. Thank you, sir. I'll see you on the other side. On the flip side. Yeah. <laughs>